following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on May 5th, 2021. 11.36 p.m. There are a total of 13 species of snake roaming about Alice Springs, but two of them are non-venomous, and three are blind. That gives you a whole lot less risk when trekking about the dry landscape. Mm -hmm. However, that didn't really make me feel safer about visiting this Australian city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose 11 species of venomous snakes is enough. Even if up to three of them might be blind. You can stumble upon a blind snake just as easily as a snake which can see, and it won't have any trouble biting you when you're on top of it. Also, it is illegal to kill snakes in Australia apparently, so that makes it even more dangerous. What about if it's attacking you? Yes, that does appear to be acceptable. A Belgian farmer moved the border between Belgium and France because he was annoyed that the stone marker was in the way of his tractor. I read about that. I like that they are making him move it back. The article I read said that it was a headache for the communities involved. It doesn't really seem like headache material. All they have to do is move the stone marker back seven and a half feet. If anything, that's backache material. Backache. Backache works too. But he was German. There's no need to get them mixed up in this. Fair point. Also, what hiker knows the location of the markers well enough to snitch in this scenario? Wouldn't the hiker have been trespassing? Well, I would know. If it's a place you hike all the time, and the stone marker was placed after the Battle of Waterloo then shifts, you'd understand that it has some meaning. Uh, perhaps. And also, does that mean this farm is in both countries? It is all a bit confusing. We found out a couple years ago that we've been cutting down dead trees that actually belong to our neighbor. Our property line is diagonal, and we thought it was a straight line. Was your property line drawn up with the Treaty of Courtrai as well? Maybe? Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the brothers Driard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about enclaves, maybe we'll talk about exclaves, maybe we'll talk about snakes, maybe walloons, or maybe we'll talk about headaches, backaches, or backaches. But we haven't plotted an exact course yet because we want you to join us on that journey. That's how it works on Things I Text My Brother. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But before we dive into subjects like snakes and border disputes, we need to take a look back. Because even though both of us are somewhere near the top experts on these subjects within our own households, there's always room for us to learn more and to correct our mistakes. Thus, it's time for ablutions and edification. Well, Brad, as we often discover around this time, we're both perfect, so we don't have any ablutions, any cleansing that needs to take place this week. But I do have a bit of edification. I was actually just listening back to our episode on bioelectricity and the Russian. And there was a moment towards the end of the podcast where we talked about the Book It program. And Book It was actually a pretty big part of our life there for a few years. So I got to wanting to know more. And I thought maybe our listeners, especially those listeners who grew up during the 80s and 90s, who wore those purple pins with the, with the stars on them, would want to refresh a course on Book It. And those of you who didn't get to experience it might want to know what we were a part of. So it all apparently began in 1984. Imagine a man who is the president of Pizza Hut. His name, a solid name, is Arthur Gunther. This is all going down in Wichita, Kansas. Now, Arthur had a son named Michael who had some eye issues when he was a kid, and he was struggling to read. And Arthur Gunther was sitting around with some business folks, and he said, wouldn't it be great if we could inspire kids to read with pizza? So they create this Book It program. And basically, if you met certain reading requirements set by your teacher, reading a certain amount of books or a certain amount of time, you could earn the certificate. And once a month, you could go and get a free personal pan pizza at Pizza Hut. And you could play the Pac-Man on that tabletop game. And this thing was incredibly effective. So some of the stuff I learned as part of this edification process after one month of this program, how many kids do you think were involved, Brad? 32 million. 7 million. You are oh. wrong. 
in oh, yeah. over 233,000 classrooms. This was within one month, though. And so they got their little free pizza award certificate. And by 1987, people like President Reagan were saluting the Book It program during the Year of the Reader. And also, there was this guy in 1988, Arkansas's governor, Bill Clinton the Human. He proclaimed a Book It Day to celebrate the success of the Book It program. And apparently, at least as of a few years ago, the program was still going on. It had been expanded to include homeschoolers could take part as well. From October 1st to March 31st every year, once a month, you could still be earning your personal pan pizza and going to Pizza Hut. And that actually made me feel great to know that children today could be motivated by eating unhealthy foods to read books. I didn't know that it was still potentially happening. What I, what I do know is my kids have participated for prizes at the library for reading books. It was, I think, the most recent thing I saw was like, 2016, although I was on Pizza Hut's website and it seemed like it was still actively promoting Book It. So I think it still exists, but our many listeners will undoubtedly correct us if we're wrong. I just uh, enjoy the fact that the guy's name was Arthur Gunther. It's always good when names rhyme. It's always good when a person who's responsible for great things is somebody's father, Arthur. Fair enough. Well, Brother Brad, I think that does it for our ablutions and edification for this round. So it's time to jump into our topic for the day, which started out with a text that involves snakes in Australia, and then a complete non sequitur jumped to a Belgian border dispute. That's how it unfolded in the text, so that's how it unfolds in real life. But we can start anywhere. Where do you want to start? Well, I think I'll probably start with the beginning of the text because... Let's start at the very beginning. beat me to it. A very good place to start. When you read, you begin with... A, B, C. When you sing, you begin with Do, Re, Mi. Do, Re, Mi. The first three notes just happen to be Do, Re, Mi. That's all I know. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do. Oh, I know the part where they go Do, Mi, 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 So, So, Re, Fa, Fa, La, Ti, Ti. Do, Mi, 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 So, So, Re, Fa, Fa, La, Ti, Ti. Do you remember that? I do. When I was in The Sound of Music in seventh grade. And I wasn't. And I played Kurt Von Trapp. Sure For those who don't remember from our previous episode about musicals, I had the fa-fa part. That was my part in the song. I bet you did it really well. In fact, I remember going and as I was watching the show each night, I was waiting for you to give us your fa's. But anyway, you said let's start at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start. What do you got? So I was looking up what was in the center of Australia, because when you look at a map of population of Australia, there's almost nobody in the middle. Everybody's on the edges and only in a few places on the edges. It's mm-hmm. a gigantic country with nobody living in the middle. Mm-hmm. So I wondered what kind of cities they had or towns or anything they had in the middle. And I found this city of about 28,000, 25, 28,000 people called Alice Springs, oh. um, which they just refer to as town or Alice most of the time if you live there. And I was in just kind of looking up some news articles about Alice Springs and I came across a question someone asked is alice springs safe and i expected it to be something about you know crime and the answer was what i said there it talked about the dangerous animals which when you look at the internet it's always there's always one of those clickbait stories that's like go to australia if you want to die or something like that Mm. and uh so apparently people really do do worry about that and they were talking about these snakes in alice springs and uh i found out that they have 170 species of snakes in australia how many 170 wow 140 land snakes and 32 sea snakes water snakes of those 170 species of snakes how many do you think are venomous 170 so this includes venomous water snakes so yes i gotta make sure i calculate accordingly uh I'm going to say 120. 100. You were not far off. That's right. Still a large proportion. In general, 20% of snakes are venomous around the world. So they're much higher than 20% at 100 out of 170. So we're talking about venomous, not poisonous, right? Because those are two different things. Yes. Yeah, so what's the difference? Do you know? Uh, I'm presuming venom has to like go into your bloodstream, whereas a poisonous snake would be like if you go and lick a snake or eat it or something, <laughs> it would be poisonous. That, that's that's pretty good. I don't know. Can you eat a venomous snake safely? You can eat a venomous snake safely. Yeah. When people eat venomous snakes. Even if you end up eating the venom? 
I don't know about eating the actual venom, but you're right on the difference between venomous and poisonous. Venomous is usually by a bite or a sting or some other way of injected into your body. And poison is a secretion mm -hmm. usually or a skin, something passed on as a defensive mechanism where venom is an attacking mechanism. So there are snakes that are not venomous, that are poisonous because they eat frogs and spiders and other things that are venomous. And the venom goes into their bodies. And if you eat the snake who ate the venomous creatures, you can get poisoned by the snake. Oh. But snakes in general are not poisonous if venom is this bad stuff and we established in a previous episode that human stomach acid can dissolve a razor blade in two minutes could human stomach acid dissolve snake venom i don't believe that human stomachs can but who knows get on it science i want answers yeah the only thing i looked up about snakes I read this random non-snake experts website, which was dedicated to uh, snakes in Australia. And so most of her points were crossed out and corrected after other people had written in and told her she was wrong. But the main picture she had of a snake on her website was apparently a legless lizard and not a snake at all, which made me wonder, like, how is she so bad at the snake thing? But also, what what is a legless lizard if it's not a snake? Because it looked exactly like a snake to me. I suppose it has something to do with the rest of its anatomy. Well, they ought to just call a snake a snake is what I'm saying. So I, I respect the non-snake person's enthusiasm for snake culture and all that. If that's the case, do you consider humans who are missing limbs as not human just because they now look like snakes? Does a human who lost all their limbs become a snake? A human without limbs would not look exactly like a snake, mm. but a legless lizard looks exactly like a snake. Mm. Yeah. I can see where you're drawing the line. Yeah. yeah. Now, Lord Voldemort without any limbs, probably a snake. Lord Voldemort with limbs is a snake. Good call. So in the spirit of the original text, we'll transition without any transition to the other part of the text exchange, which was all about Belgian border disputes. Now, the first thing I would like to say is that this all came from a story that was making it across the international media at the beginning of May this year. It was all about this, uh, this controversy where a marker stone between Belgium and France had been moved, allegedly moving the border. And it was no major uproar, but this, the stone had been moved about seven and a half feet. And the mayor of the one side was saying funny things and the mayor of the other side was saying funny things. But they were also saying, we're going to get this moved back. What I found out today is that the original story, as it was presented at least by the BBC, and then pretty much every other news source seemed to quote the BBC stories. So we're talking New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, Fox News, all these different places were essentially just quoting the BBC story. They were all saying that it was a farmer who got annoyed with it, moved the stone out of his tractor's path, and blah, blah, blah. Well, I went on to discover from a guy named Tim the Traveler, who had a YouTube video, which was delightful. Is he related to Tim the Enchanter? He is definitely related to Tim the Enchanter. You know how I know? It's because they call him Tim. I like it. But Tim the Traveler, who has this YouTube series, actually went out there on a bus somewhere like a month later. He found that it wasn't actually on the edge of a like farmable field. It was at the edge of a property that could be called the farm. But it was later also discovered, not by Tim, but by one of the government officials, that the owner of the land was not a farmer at all. He was a retired veterinarian who claimed no knowledge of having moved the stone or no real reason for moving the stone. And this is all taking place in these communities right on the edge of Belgium and France. Even the names there get a little bit confused. So basically, it would have been land added to a Belgian community, either a, a larger Belgian community called Urquelen, um, or a smaller uh, Belgian community that's kind of like a sub-community of Urquelen called Montigny saint christophe But all of this would have been at the expense of the French city of boisigny sur roc and the mayor of boisigny sur roc is Aurélie Willenek. She said that we should be able to avoid a new border war. And the Belgian mayor of the other town said, although I was happy my town was bigger, you know, we'll get this stone moved back. And he planned to reach out to the farmer who had moved this thing with his tractor. But a lot of the story seems to be untrue. But I thought it was also cool that just if you walk on the border between Belgium and France, you're going to see a bunch of these fairly heavy, not large, but heavy enough that you're not going to move them with your hands. These stone markers, and they're going to say the year 1819, 
the significance of that is in 1815 is when Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo. And um, it took them a few years to get the paperwork in order, but they started laying out the border stones in 1819. And in 1820, they passed the official concord between, it was between France and the Netherlands, which Belgium was a part of at the time. In 1820, it was the Treaty of Courtrai, uh, which is pronounced a little bit differently, depending on whether you're using the French version or the Dutch version or whatever it is. I'm not really going to try the, the Dutch version, but the Treaty of Courtrai, which basically set up the, the border between what has now become Belgium and France, 390 miles. So there's these stones all along them. And if you move them, as it turns out, you haven't actually moved the border. The border is established by more scientific means these days because there are other places where rivers have shifted and all of their different kinds of things to uh, keep into consideration. So this farmer hadn't actually made anybody's land bigger, but he was breaking other laws which say you're not allowed to mess with these border stones in essence. All in all, it ended up being totally not that impressive. It wasn't an annoyed farmer. We don't really know who did it, and it didn't create any kind of significant dispute between Belgium and France. In the end, it's much ado about very little. So what was the name of the French city? Boisigny, or Bousigny, sur Roc. So Roc as in rock? I assume so, R-O-C. Yeah, it'd be appropriate if it was named Roc, and they were haggling over Roc, although it doesn't sound like they actually were haggling over Roc. Even though this story ended up being, frankly, not all that impressive, and I don't know as of recording today, like three months after the original incident, I don't know if the rock has been moved back, but moving the rock seven and a half feet outside a barbed wire fence under a tree at the edge of a non, a non-cultivated piece of land is not that exciting. But it got me thinking about border disputes, interesting border disputes or, or whatever the case may be. And first off, I was just looking up and trying to see how many border disputes like of significant nature are there today. I'm not talking about this little joke between Belgium and France, but like border disputes are usually awful, like the 38th yeah. parallel and Yep. And and there there are a lot of big ones going on just in the 21st century alone. You have dozens of them taking place in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan and India and Pakistan have had a number of them. Of course, uh, the the Russo-Ukrainian war is all about border disputes. Israel, Palestine, Azerbaijan, yeah, Lebanon and Israel have fought as well. So there are tons of these very serious border disputes going on. South China Sea, Taiwan. Yeah, but there are also a number of ones that are kind of fun or different and and haven't necessarily been, some of them haven't been disputed in a while. So I got to looking up some odd or or less known border disputes. The Spratly Islands are in the South China Sea. That one is disputed by six different nations. There's a glacier disputed by India and Pakistan in the Himalayas known as Siachen Glacier. And it's considered the highest battleground on earth because when they were creating the dividing line between India and Pakistan, they're like, Uh, We'll just draw it up to the bottom of this glacier because nobody's going to fight over that. And guess what they did? They decided to fight over that. There's a temple in Cambodia that was once claimed by Thailand's crown. There's a lighthouse, which the Russians built on an island that they shared with Sweden. Uh, It became part of Finland when it was no longer under Russia's control. But that meant that there was a Finnish lighthouse on a Swedish island, and it was heavily disputed by two nations. If you want to see one of the, the weirdest borders you'll ever see, look at a map of Market Island and the Market Lighthouse um, so that they could make it so the lighthouse was in Finnish territory, uh, even though they had built it on the Swedish half of this island. But then there were some that I really enjoyed, and one that I didn't even know of, even though it was in a city that I had lived in for a number of years. Apparently, there is a piece of land which is attached to the Bronx, which the Bronx is the mainland United States of America. Manhattan is an island just off of the mainland United States of America. But there is a piece of Manhattan that is actually attached to the Bronx. And the reason for this is it was originally attached to Manhattan. And then in 1895, they built a canal called the Harlem Ship Canal, which cut off this little area called Marble Hill from Manhattan. And then later on, In 1914, they ended up filling in the other side of the island, which meant that that Marble Hill that was once part of Manhattan was now attached to the Bronx. 
but it is still a piece of Manhattan officially, even though it has the Bronx Police Department and every once in a while figures from the Bronx will sneak up and throw a, a sacred Bronx flag on top of it. I did not know that there was this piece of Manhattan that has connected the Bronx. So I like that one. Well, because it's surrounded, I assume has water on one side, yes? Yep. Still. And uh, the rest of it's surrounded by the, by the Bronx. That makes it an enclave because it's surrounded by one locality that is not the locality where it belongs. Wouldn't it have to be completely surrounded by the Bronx? It can be considered an enclave because it's not contiguous to the nation or the locality, in this instance, Manhattan, but the rest of it is surrounded by the Bronx. There's enclaves and then there's exclaves, which I learned because there's part of Belgium that's in the Netherlands. So there's this area called Barle Herto, which is the Belgian name, and then Barle Nassau, which is the Dutch side. Basically, within the Netherlands, within the border of Netherlands, there's these enclaves of Belgian territory, but they're actually exclaves because they border technically on two side, two different parts. Enclave is surrounded by one, exclave is by one or more, but it's all Holland. But they call them exclaves. Mm. There also is a point in there that they have a quadra point, mm -hmm. which is like four, like the four corners in the United States, where it's a quadra point where four different places touch, but it's still just Netherlands and Belgium, but it's still called a quadra point because within this area of Barley, 12 different patches of Belgium. So it's a an area with all these little parts of it are Belgium, and all these other parts are the Netherlands, and it all tracks back to the 1100s, to the property and the way it was split up back then. But you have mm. houses that are in both countries, and they're considered in whichever <laughs> country their front door is in. So that's how they decide. There's one house that has two front doors, so it can be in both countries. There's a supermarket that has its front door in one, and most of the other rest of the supermarket is in another. They had laws in the Netherlands where you, you couldn't be out at a, at a cafe after a certain time, hmm. but the cafe happened to be in both the Netherlands and Belgium. So they just moved all the patrons to Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> at the time that they had to shut down in the Netherlands and just served them on the Belgian side, even if they were Dutch people, they could still go over there. There was until the until the Eurozone started, there was a lot of smuggling because fireworks were legal here or there, or the taxes on butter was yeah. more here or there. And so they would smuggle things in and out of their nations that way good, good. Uh, to avoid all the taxes and everything that would go on them. Belgium is kind of weird. I was thinking of this with the border dispute. And I was looking up, are there other tensions between Belgium and France? And apparently the two get along pretty well. But what I was starting to realize is if there is going to be a border dispute between the Belgians and anybody, it'd probably be between the Walloons in the French part of Belgium and the Flemish people in the other part would be much more likely to have border disputes and drama. I saw an interesting map map channel on YouTube. Uh, this person named Ali Bai, O L L I E B Y E. Ali Bai has taken time to map, and I'm not going to vouch for the accuracy of these maps, but they've taken time to sh uh, show the pro progression of of maps. Because I was really interested in how often do borders really change? I mean, yes, wars and things like that. But how often do they just kind of evolve over time? And if you really look historically, they've done so incredibly. So I looked at one piece of it was specifically the Netherlands. And since Belgium came out of the Netherlands, I kind of watched this four or five minute video, you know, progression of a map. And it was pretty stable. So starting in 300 of the common era, it was France and then Saxony. And it was kind of all in that area. And it was pretty stable. It was pretty much just France or Saxony all the way until about 850 CE and then there was a little bit more but in a lot in 1000 CE and in 1100 CE it just exploded so like mm. France just fell apart Saxony fell apart and you had all these little tiny nation states that just started showing up there and Holland was of course one of them and then Holland was small and then Holland was big and then as you get into the 1800s Belgium starts Luxembourg starts but Luxembourg was separated around Belgium at one point so there were two parts to Luxembourg so there was mm. Holland Luxembourg Belgium Luxembourg all in this area just kind of interesting to look at how that kind of evolved and, and how the maps evolve we were talking about countries that split up into different parts, and that actually created a bit of a potential border dispute, but really a semantics and naming dispute, which I had very recently realized for the first time that there was a country called North Macedonia. And I was like, where in the world did North Macedonia come from? It used to be called F-Y-R-O-M, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. That was its name for a while. 
Exactly. So it was, or, and I had seen something calling it the Socialist Republic of Macedonia when it first split off of Yugoslavia in 1991. But that made the Greeks annoyed because many people in Greece feel that they are descended completely from Alexander, Alexander the, Great, the right? Great and that version of Macedonia, which has nothing to do apparently, and I wouldn't have known this, but I was reading this today, with ethnic Macedonia, the people in what is now known as North Macedonia. So apparently for about two and a half decades after Yugoslavia split up, there was a pretty heated debate, not necessarily over borders, but over the naming rights to the word Macedonia until it finally got settled a few years ago by Macedonia basically saying, okay, we'll be North Macedonia. We won't claim your Alexander the great or any of that nonsense so you get to be historic macedonia we get to be you know future north macedonia it's kind of like the cleveland browns and what part of their history do they get to claim or does do the baltimore ravens get to claim it because baltimore lost out on their colts but they don't get to claim the colts history because they're still colts as ever the nfl history books are analogous to what's going on in the former yugoslavia ohio and michigan came to arms fighting for Toledo territory when Michigan was a province and Ohio was a state. And that happened to be happening at the same time as what was going on as Belgium became a nation. So in 1835 and 1836, we fought over that strip of land in Northern Ohio from the lake to Indiana and uh, Ohio got Toledo and Michigan got shafted by getting the upper peninsula. Although that may seem a little better now. Yeah, I think we could, Ohio would probably trade that back straight up if they could. You know, they didn't actually resolve, fully resolve that dispute between Ohio and Michigan until 1973. Was that Bo and Woody? No, it was not Bo and Woody. In <laughs> 1973, they finally resolved, they took the case to the Supreme Court to determine where the border between Ohio and Michigan is in Lake Erie. Oh. And so Michigan wanted it to go straight west-east or east-west. But it, in in fact, goes diagonal, just like my property line. So very confusing. But it goes (laughs) diagonal. And there actually is an island, Turtle Island, that is half Michigan and half Ohio. Well, that dog just ain't going to hunt. I don't have anything to say about that. You were just speaking, though, of disputes that aren't officially over. One of the more interesting land disputes or border disputes that I came across, actually, it's more of a land dispute, is one that apparently has rendered it so that Russia and Japan have not officially signed a formal peace treaty ending World War II. Did you know that? I did only because I saw that in my research. Yeah, the the Kuril Islands. So on the same day that the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, the Russian army basically moved into this one of these islands of the Kuril Islands and they booted out something like 17,000, I think I saw, Japanese residents. They've since beefed up the population and, and um, beefed it up in terms of military capacity as well to 30-some thousand people. And there are a lot of fish and minerals and other natural resources on there uh, that make it so that neither side wants the other side to have it. But Russia actually has a military district there that is prepared to fight off the Japanese if they ever decided to take it back. So this one still apparently has some heat and some animosity, uh, unlike some of the other ones, which seem to be just kind of laughing haha, like uh, Denmark and Canada have a, an island that they routinely uh, will send some troops on, change the flag and leave a bottle of alcohol in a note saying it's ours again, ha ha ha. Um, but that's not what's going on in these Curl Islands. Apparently, the Russians have to hold it, not necessarily by force, but with intent. They lost that set of islands prior to World War I during the, the Russian, the Russo-Japanese War. They had those islands at one point, and they thought they were going to go and have this war with Japan and win really easily, but they didn't have most of their navy on that side of the world. It was on the European side of Russia at the time, and they kind of got their behinds handed to them by Japan. So perhaps that's some of why they don't want to give it back. It seems like historically that theory of it isn't going to be too hard to beat up on Japan doesn't tend to work out very well. There's only one other border dispute that I came across today that I found really interesting, and it was because I didn't know anything about it. And it's yet another place that I spend a ton of time. There was an island in the Potomac River down by Washington, D.C. that, well, I should say it was an island in high tide because the water would go up around some marshy areas. At low tide, 
it was attached to the Virginia side of the Potomac River across from Washington, D.C. And when the original borders were drawn up for Maryland and Virginia there, D.C. was eventually carved out of what was Maryland. When the original borders were drawn up, it basically said that the dividing line between the two sides would not go down like the center of the river as it often would in most places, but it would be that Maryland would have uh, the entire Potomac as well. So the border was on the opposite shoreline. So that made it tricky though, when this island called Alexander's Island was in the Potomac River for part of the time, which once this part of Maryland had become DC, it meant that when this island was in the river, it belonged to DC. And then the river drops three feet. This island is no longer an island. It's attached to Virginia. And so there was this dispute over Alexander's Island. Which side does it belong to? And it didn't really matter for a long time till eventually somebody decided to put a horse racing track in. And horse racing was illegal in the District of Columbia, but legal in Virginia. So they had to take it to the court. And the judge decided to allow the horse racing track, which in essence was basically just saying uh, this piece of land is in Virginia. But then they went all the way back and were reading some old documents between uh, old documents established by Lord Baltimore and the original Maryland decree. And it just got really messy. And eventually they decided that this uh, Alexander's Island was in fact an island and a part of D.C. But all this becomes interesting is that horse racing track is now long gone, but the parking lots attached to the largest government building in the United States, known as the Pentagon, are now on that property. And so the Pentagon, which sits as you're over there, it sits squarely in Virginia, apparently has a Washington, D.C. address because of this age-old land dispute that was going on there. And I never had heard anything about that. Not that it's a it's a disputed border, but I was going down that path of enclaves and exclaves and, and reading a little bit about them. And uh, I had heard a little bit about it, about it during the pandemic where there were parts of the United States that are actually surrounded by Canada and uh, Americans were not allowed to go into Canada. So you had these people in these small towns that are part of the United States, but stuck in Canada. Mm -hmm. And can't get out to go anywhere. And I was reading about one of them in Minnesota. The Angle? Yeah, the Northwest Angle. The Northwest Angle. Yeah. I didn't read about that recently, but I, I am aware of this place. What I found most exciting about it, did you ever see the uh, border crossing? I know they have to go to like a, a booth and self-report, don't they? <laughs> it's called Jim's Corner. And it's this little shack. And there's a video phone on the outside of the shack and a video phone on the inside. And there is a button, two buttons, one for Canada and one for the United States. And you have to go into this little shack or outside this little shack and you hit the button for can for the United States if you're going into the Northwest Angle. And you hit the button for Canada if you're coming out. And it's about 40 miles drive from Minnesota to get to this place in through Manitoba. But I, I found it fascinating to have this tiny little shack and they named it Jim's Corner. Who's Jim? I couldn't find out why they call it Jim's Corner. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, if you're listening, why don't you go ahead and send us a message? Do you think he's one of our six listeners? Yes. I mean, proportionally, that seems unlikely. But if it was, that would be pretty great. <laughs> and so at one point, they had to have been doing this before videos existed, right? So how mm -hmm. are they getting in and out? Perhaps Jim was actually the border agent who sat in the corner and let people mm -hmm. in and out. That's That's what I'm going with now. Regardless of what they used to do, I'm sure Rick Moranis is responsible for all of this. There you go. Yeah. Well, Brad, we've done an awful lot of talking about border disputes today, and a little bit of talking about snakes, but there's one man who would never get into a dispute with a snake, and he certainly wouldn't trade his native Toledo to Michigan for the Upper Peninsula. His name is Arthur Dreer. We know him as Father Art, and we're going to ask him some questions. How many species of venomous snakes is enough for one pound? One. One? You would allow one? One is more than enough. One's more than enough. At least you can keep cracking them. Now. Do you have any suggestions for things that France and Belgium can fight about if a border dispute over a farmer moving a rock isn't divisive enough? No, I, I don't think so. I think maybe the Tour de France is, is enough to keep them arguing for a long time, and, and soccer, of course. 
Do you ever have a snake in your house or your garage that you had to remove? Um, no, other than garter snakes, but I do remember camping at Mommy Bay State Park and I saw a, a snake that, that came out of a, a hole in a, in a storage cupboard. I didn't have to do anything with it, but it did set me back a little bit. Have you ever picked up a snake? Yes, but not, not no very big snakes and never a poisonous snake. Did you pick it up because it was in your flower bed or something you had to move it, or you just pick it up because you were someplace where they were letting people touch snakes? Well, no, it, it, uh, I remember garden, garter snakes and you know, the few times I did any gardening, but that's about it. Well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything we can say about Walloons, the Northwest Angle, the Upper Peninsula, the Treaty of Courtrai, Book It Pizzas, Arthur Gunther, and Bill Clinton the Human. But fear not, there will be another episode coming along shortly, just as soon as we can dig back into the archives and find another gem of a text exchange and do enough research that we can pretend we know what we're talking about. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you liked, what you didn't like, or to tell us about something we got completely wrong. You might even have enough time to go tell a friend, an enemy, and a total stranger to give us a listen as well. If you manage to do any of that, the fraternity of Drew Yards will be forever grateful. But most importantly, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. There was a TV show that was on, I think, that channel they tried to start up earlier in the year that had like 15-minute shows. What was it called? Quibi! Quibi! Quibi. Yeah. So I didn't have Quibi. I never saw anything on Quibi. But apparently one of the shows on there was called like Murder House Flippers or something. And it was all about flipping houses that murders had happened in. Oh, I, I so wanted to ask the people down the street that moved into the serial killer's house if they still had the chocolate line on the ground and stuff. Uh, but I, I never the asked. The fact that my house was new on the inside made that the knowledge that somebody was killed in here. It didn't seem tangible, I guess. Well, the guy, I mean, the guy got out on bail while he was waiting for trial. So he was living in the house where he, he killed his wife. And I'm curious as to what rules he had to live there. Like, How many people did your neighbor kill? In theory, uh, he was involved in the death of four people that we know of. Three wives and uh, the hitman. For and the were last the trees one. you were cutting down on his property? No. Because no, he lived two doors not. down. He had two doors down, yeah. yeah. Gerald Bob the Killing Hand. Huh? Yeah. Gerald Bob Hand. Gerald Bob the Killing Hand. Why is it Gerald Bob? That his name was Gerald, but he went by Bob. Uh, Always a bad sign.